Good morning, all. Our first panel is Cultivating Allyship in Defense and Security Sectors, moderated by Captain Danielle Hickson, a military professor for the Joint Military Operations Department and the WPS Lead for Outreach at the Naval War College. It's now my pleasure to welcome Captain Danielle Hickson. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Thank you all for joining us. Introducing this very important topic of allyship for your first panel of the Naval War College's 10th annual Women, Peace, and Security Symposium. As a joint military operations professor, I spend a great deal of time thinking about the complex security environment we are in and how we as the United States military and our partners and allies will fight and defend the international rules-based order against our near peer adversaries. This is going to take an all hands on deck effort. We need all walks of life to join the fight. This is going, and then when we need to harness the power and brilliance of every sailor, soldier, Marine, to build a strong war fighting team ready to take on our adversaries. With women composing just over half the US population, we do not have the luxury to leave them out. We must ensure their meaningful participation in our military. What does that mean? It means having significant numbers of women in all levels of decision making. We need to move past the first and have female leaders integrated as the norm. To get there, we must be able to recruit, retain, and promote women throughout the military. In our competitive employment market, women must feel included in our military, feel as a valued contributor if we want them to choose a career in the military and stay. This is imperative to building the warfighting team we need for our national security. Allyship, the topic of our panel today, I argue is key to making female feel included in the military. I often hear from colleagues here, of course, I'm an ally for women. I have a wife, a daughter. But I argue to you that being an ally takes more than that. It takes affirmative steps. It takes empathy and recognition of the experiences of those in the underrepresented group. It takes deliberate attention and conscious thought of gender biases and societal norms. Thought about the in-group and the out-group. These are all things you will hear more about from our impressive panelists. I particularly think this is a worthy topic here in a male-dominated environment of the Naval War College and that of the Greater Navy and Department of Defense, where I feel some believe women are already fully in integrated into the military, and many men are left wondering what their role is in women, peace, and security. While allyship is something everyone can practice, it does not na na necessarily naturally occur, which is why discussion like we are having today is so crucial. Why do women even need allies in a workplace? How do allies, or the lack thereof, impact the experience of women in the defense and security sectors, and in turn, impact the recruitment, retention, and promotion of women. These are the vital topics that we will discuss today. I think we have a motivating group of panelists for this discussion that will engage you and make you think. First, we will hear remarks from Dr. Curtis Bell, who is the director of the new Maritime Security and Governance Staff Course and an associate professor of the International Programs Department here at the Naval War College. Dr. Bell has published on a range of topics, including representation and inclusion, and has worked on gender and maritime security, both here at the college and in his capacity as the founder of the maritime security NGO called Stable Seas. Our second panelist is Lieutenant Commander Melanie Lacaros. She is a Naval Flight Officer and a student here at the Naval War College. Last semester, she participated in our new elective on WPS and she wrote a research paper on allyship for that course. I hope you listen carefully to her remarks. She represents the group of mid-grade female officers that must feel included so that she, she and they will stay. 
Last but not least, our final presenter, Dr. James Minnick, here all the way from Hawaii. Thank you. <laughs> he is a retired you He's a retired U.S. Army Colonel and esteemed professor at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Dr. Minnick hosts the Security Nexus webinar series and plays a pivotal role in shaping global security dialogues. A longtime supporter and former chair of Women, Peace and Security, who has extensively written on security studies. Each panelist will give some short remarks, which will hopefully provoke thought and spur good discussion. We plan to reserve about half our time for questions from our in-person audience and those in Zoom land. Without further ado, Dr. Bell, can you start us off with your comments on inclusion without representation? How can men promote WPS in a male dominant environment? Sure, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here today to speak about allyship and uh, please understand my role on the panel is really to frame some broad questions about allyship and what that means before our other panelists get into uh, the particulars of this context a bit more, I think. Uh, I have to start by saying though that it feels a little strange to speak on a panel on this topic because I've always thought of listening, creating space for others, uh, and trying first to understand as the central tenets of allyship. So there's something strange about speaking on that. Uh, so in that spirit, I'll keep my comments short so that we can make space for other speakers, uh, both on stage and out in the audience today. So as you heard, I'm Curtis Bell. I'm a professor here at the Naval War College. And for many reasons, uh, I, I feel like one of these blue squares in the grid most of the time. Uh, this is my home turf. I've been on this stage many times. My office is right up the stairs and like 80 something percent of the faculty here, I'm white, I'm male and I'm educated. But I have just enough going on to feel a little orange sometimes too. I'm a civilian academic with no prior military service. I don't love being called doctor because I feel like it creates distance between me and most of the people I work with day to day. I'm 40 years old. So I do a lot of smiling and nodding when my colleagues are talking about cultural references. Uh, they're not quite 40. Uh, and I have plenty of other personal things going on that make me feel insecure about my place here day to day. So if that's a strange and uncomfortable introduction, I want to highlight that feeling because we're social animals and we're under tremendous pressure to fit in with each other. We know that when people join groups, they quickly attempt to build and then leverage social standing within that group. And they do this by sizing each other up, looking for visual cues that might suggest shared interests and experiences, and then emphasizing those because it builds social capital and improves trust within the group to the obvious detriment of any group members who may not fit any new archetypes that are starting to get created. We've seen this on every reality show, right? Subgroup identities form, and these identities provide security to members who feel like they fit in while fomenting imposter syndrome among those who feel like they're faking their way through at best. I'm sure you have examples from your own units and workplaces. I can certainly point to a few clicks like this around the college, and I really like seeing how people decorate their offices. That's one of the ways that we see people trying to signal to each other how they fit in here. So I want to start our panel by acknowledging that it can be tough if you feel like you're one of these orange cells, especially if that social differentiator is something that is uh, pretty visible and ever present in your life, including gender. While blue cells are trying to build credibility with each other by highlighting their shared interests and experiences, the orange cells face strong incentives to assimilate or suffer social exclusion. In a more diverse group, shared experiences might be more cross-cutting, but in a picture like this, there's very clear pressure to adopt to the ways of the blue. Do we really have inclusion if the orange cells need to wear blue masks to feel included? I'm starting here with this pretty simple point because this is what inclusion and allyship really means to me. It's not a numerator juxtaposed against a denominator it isn't a human resources problem of recruitment or retention, though these things are very important. 
Uh, it's a shared and constant awareness of all of the small things we're doing every day to establish social standing and create our team cultures. So if you're here, you're more likely than not to be in an organization that looks almost like this grid that we see on the slide. I'd encourage you to take a moment then for honest reflection, and you can think beyond gender to other aspects of identity that might be relevant in your workplaces. What do you talk about in the minutes before meetings start? Are they topics that deepen the ties between people who are already similar, or are they topics that are intentionally selected to bring in people who may not share the experiences with the majority? Are your standards for measuring teamwork, collegiality, and performance objective? Or are they too reliant upon the social trust and informal relationships that are built through all of these informal interactions? If a fundamental aspect of your identity changed today, how would your experience on your team be different tomorrow? And how might it change your relationships and your interactions? So this isn't rocket science. It isn't hard, but I think it does require intention and self-awareness every day. When we think about inclusion and allyship in this way, it becomes obvious to me why changing leadership structures is not enough to create the culture of inclusion. Diverse leadership is important, but it's not sufficient. An orange cell running this team would face tremendous pressure to build credibility with all of the blue cells by overemphasizing blue traits and interests. We see this in many studies of women in leadership positions, particularly when the organization they're running is as imbalanced as this. Recent research on the so-called glass cliff effect finds that a first female leader is often brought in to clean up a mess and then immediately feels the pressure to build credibility by emphasizing traits that are more common in the men they supervise. Often they were hired or promoted into difficult situations and they're about 24% more likely to be fired or relieved relative to men. Harvard Business Review is full of studies like this, and I'm sure you can come up with plenty of examples in your own careers or reading of the news. So when we talk about allyship, uh, we often think in the way that I've started, thinking about creating cultures among peers on a team, at least I do. Uh, but as we see more women and members of underrepresented groups in leadership positions, uh, including our college and our Navy, I think it's critical for us to turn the conversation and think about how we can also be allies to a woman above us on the organizational chart. Within that power structure, what obligation do employees and subordinates have to create an inclusive environment? And what do we owe our superiors who are facing well-known and well-documented identity-based obstacles to their work? I don't have great answers here, but I'd love to discuss this in the Q&A if we have time. I wanna close with a final point for our Naval War College environment. I don't really care for the language of allyship because in this military and policy environment, uh, we have a very different understanding of what it means to be an ally. Uh, being an ally in this context doesn't require any formal documentation or recognition or, or public pronouncements. It doesn't require specific commitments for costly grand gestures in the future. We're not announcing allies to create any sense of deterrence, as far as I can tell. Uh, we certainly don't want to imply any obligations of, of reciprocity. When we think of allyship in, in the way that we usually use it in our work, I think it tends to reduce our focus to a few representation-related high-stakes decisions that happen, uh, usually related to leadership, promotion, retention, recruitment. Again, these are all important. But this isn't what allyship means for most of us, and it's not enough. I think instead what we're talking about here is steady, it's understated, and it's often unseen support that is neither formal nor grand in scope. It's everyday empathy. It's willingness to be self-aware. This form of allyship values innumerable micro gestures over public grand gestures. And those micro gestures include ending on time and opening more space for more perspectives. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. And now over to Lieutenant Commander Lacaro's for remarks on allyship and masculinity. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep, all right. Thank you and good morning, everyone. 
I am truly honored to be here and be part of this panel to share my perspective on male allyship as a woman and a WPS practitioner. Um, as previously mentioned, I wrote, I wrote a research paper for my WPS elective, and it's on this topic because I'm passionate that it is a fundamental necessity that we'll see through this, the successful implementation of WPS initiatives. So let's see. Okay. Oh, okay. So what is male allyship and why does it matter, right? So male allyship matters. Um, I guess I went too far back, right? So male allyship matters because the military is still a male-dominated workplace that largely still values masculine traits. And it has much to improve upon to truly include women and in other marginalized groups. And despite significant strides in policy, WPS implementation continues to face challenges because it's hard to see at times why it might matter enough for our institutions to allot time, energy, and resources to this. But I do hope that in the opening remarks of this WPS symposium that you've garnered a little bit of why it's important so far. So one of the common barriers that I see to successful male allyship begins with the fact that it can be difficult for my male peers and leaders to see how the status quo impacts people differently. So consider this example in this photo here. This photo was taken of a picture. It's a picture of the women in my air wing during a deployment. And I remember in my ready room, there was a male junior officer who saw this women's air wing photo posted on our flight schedule. And he said out loud, well, what about the men? And then he added more to it. Where's the men photo? So through one lens, as I heard that, I could view that example as well as it's an example of how men struggle, as this quote here beautifully states, that the system, they, they struggle to see that the system was designed by men for men to do what is still considered men's work. And in the military, men are the default. So what does that mean? Being the default means that everything is assumed to be centered around men unless it's otherwise stated. That's why you don't see a post on social media that's going to come out from the Navy that celebrates 50 years of men in naval aviation. It's because they've always been assumed to have been part of naval aviation. I have more feelings on that, but I won't add that there. <laughs> but despite being, but furthermore, being the default includes everything from the design to your of your equipment, your uniforms, access to that, to everything to do your jobs, right? To being taken seriously as a professional, a warfighter, and a leader. And I find that the men that I work with are generally such, they have been great people. I've had great leaders. I have great peers. They have, they're very professional. They have often great intentions. But the struggle is there to recognize, understand, and empathize the experiences that uh, their female colleagues go through, and sometimes on a regular basis. And I know this isn't done intentionally, but sometimes they're, they don't want to hear it or they don't get it. And so that's why sometimes I have issues with the terms like gender issues, gender perspectives, because it often ends up being synonymous with women. And then therefore I find further frustration because it ends up falling on women and even other marginalized groups to solve these problems. But I, on one hand, I want that because I have control issues in a way that I don't trust other people maybe to touch those problems, right? I know some people feel that. On the other side, I know I can't do that by myself. I, I, I can't do it by myself because one, it's exhausting. It, it takes a lot of bandwidth. And I think it's better that we have a partnership in trying to improve our system for everyone that's in it, because I think that garners more buy-in in terms of making lasting changes. And so for me, allyship matters because I know I can't change the system. I may struggle to move forward in my career, and I may struggle to break down barriers for WPS without the support of male allies. So to move to the next slide here, that I was originally on, what is male allyship? It's, it's, it's about actively promoting gender fairness and equity in the workplace. And I think that quote beautifully describes it because those actions that you take are intended to drive systemic improvements to the workplace culture. So consider my where's the men photo example from the previous slide. That incident, it would have been good if any of those men in my ready room would have said something, but none of them did. Now, why is it important, right? Because it would have been important because it, undermine, it would undermine that guy's confidence, confidence that he likely gained from his experiences, understanding, socialization, perception of the command culture, views on what was deemed acceptable in his time throughout being in that command and in the military overall. 
someone saying something would have undermined that guy's conversational, that he had conversational permission to openly express a manifestation of his sexism out loud and with the intent for women, me, the only one in the room at the time, to hear, right? But none of them did. And, you know, I, I admit I was disappointed in that. And so when you look at what can men do, right? I think some of you might be thinking, well, you know, what if that was one comment? That's one guy, get over it. It's been a while. You know, it's an emotional response. Men aren't like this. Men, I haven't seen this in my workplace. Men aren't like this. Or it was probably just a joke. Or maybe you had a stronger response in that story. Then you're like, this is just so woke. This is so politically correct. You can't say anything anymore without someone getting offended. Because I have heard those sentiments, right? Sure, maybe in some cases there is a communication breakdown, but it is these exact attitudes that I just presented to you that allows small things to continue in the command and our workplace culture and those things add up. And those things matter to the people that have to deal with them every day. And I, I tell you, those attitudes also tell me about where someone might stand in the social hierarchy. But more importantly, I want you to realize that those attitudes can severely undermine any kind of policy change or workplace culture that you're trying to implement. And furthermore, that it would just derail trying to implement WPS and any other inclusivity efforts. I don't think enough people realize how that, that attitude can, can spread. If you take one person who is loud and influ influential in your command, it doesn't matter where they're at, if they're even a leadership position or not. If that person is loud and can influence all the people around them, that attitude makes a big difference. And then furthermore, if that person is respected, they're liked, they're moving farther in their career, that can change the trajectory of how something goes. It can either see support for inclusivity efforts or it can cause um, you know, everyone to turn against it. And that's what I've seen at times. So am I really too woke for demanding gender fairness and equity in a workplace through male allyship? Or is it possible that the system was not exactly designed through male bias because it was not designed for women originally to be part of it. So if the latter is true, then I need male allies to step up and do more to change the system and allow for people like me to have our fullest potential on the table and potentially leveraged. Okay. So I think one of the things, there are many ways that we can be allies, but addressing sexist behavior is obviously one way that you can do in the list here is condensed, but that last one there, about masculinity, I think is incredibly critical and a good place to start for anyone on their allyship journey. Um, I think it's because the male, it's a male dominated society in most places. The military is still very male dominated. You have men at every level. And so there's a lot of deeply entrenched masculine norms, right? And so if we can have an understanding of our relationships with masculinity, especially men as allies, if you can have an understanding of your own relationship with masculinity, your organization's relationship with masculinity, and how those views and that socialization and that the culture from the outside of the military comes into the military, then it, you can have an, a good foundation as uh, people in the military service as to how you might be able to approach being an ally. Because Senior leaders getting policy in place is great. That's a huge you know, struggle, but um, to institutionalize gender inclusive policies and fully implement it requires everyone else below to be on board. So I want more from my 05s and 06s. I want more from my peers. I want more from my NCOs to then empower the people below me. But I, you know, I argue that, you know, those are supposed to be things that are. I, th I would have thought would be obvious, but it's not always something that is obvious if people don't experience it. Um, so I think to create work environments that empower men to succeed as allies in the first place with overall intent to foster a more inclusive culture, our organizations must reform its relationships with those deeply entrenched and potentially harmful di gender dynamics and, and formulate that to be something a little bit healthier and more productive take the goods that you can get from femininity, masculinity, and everything else in between, and how does that translate to something that can make us into a more effective fighting force? 
But I recognize that allyship is not as easy as it sounds, so I apologize to maybe disagree, but because there's a very real social cost that can be associated with allies. And, and that will influence a lot of what I've seen in terms of men's willingness to act. There's a cost or risk associated with being an ally that sometimes outweighs any benefit to being an ally. And at the core of it though, it's about allyship will always be about action. So if you value having a professional and inclusive workplace environment, and then I need you to step up and take this seriously, allyship needs to be a hallmark of professional of military professionalism. And I will end on this because I'm pretty sure I went over time. I'm a naval officer, naval flight officer at that. And the Navy's core values say honor, courage, and commitment, not honor, comfort, and complicity. Honor, courage, and commitment aren't just for the battlefield. They're in the everyday actions that we take as service members. So I urge men to step up as allies. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Dr. Minnick, if you can round us out with your presentation on the strength of allyship, cultivating belonging for team success. I'm absolutely uh, honored to join my voice with uh, those who have spoken already today. Imagine a powerful force deliberately restricting its strength by underutilizing almost 20% of its personnel. This is the reality facing the military where outdated policies, biases prevent women from fully contributing their skills and their expertise. Less than 50 years ago, women were restricted to just 2% of our military force. Despite progress, systemic barriers continue to limit the contributions of women today. True gender allyship is the key to unlocking this potential. It's about cultivating an inclusive environment where everyone thrives, ensuring every service member has an equal opportunity to succeed. This historical trajectory underscores a critical distinction. Integration still expects women to adapt to a male-defined system, whereas true inclusion requires the system to evolve, leveraging the full potential of both men and women. The evolution from gender-segregated service to a more integrated force highlights our progress, but reveals the necessity for a more profound cultural shift. At the heart of this transformation is gender allyship. Gender allyship is a proactive stance, a journey toward fundamentally reshaping these frameworks to ensure every service member, regardless of gender, is valued and empowered. It's about moving from a culture of compliance to one of commitment a fundamental yet impactful framework propel, propels gender allyship. Be no do. The first principle of allyship is be. Be a leader of character, committed to opposing practices that marginalize, exclude, and harm women. But what does it truly mean to be an ally? It starts with challenging our personal and institutional biases. It means acting on our belief in justice, equality, and dignity. Inclusivity becomes a core principle through our leadership, requiring the courage to change norms and value every member equally. Trailblazing women face immense systemic barriers. Consider Lieutenant Colonel Robin Fellows, who I interviewed recently, She's Australia's first female Green Beret commando. Despite her extraordinary achievement in passing the grueling qualification courses, her success led not to celebration, but a policy change instantly barring women from that role. This deliberate undermining of her accomplishment and, and discouraged future female candidates for the next 15 years. This discrimination fueled by outdated views, highlights the persistent sexism that women routinely confront. Like 
Lieutenant Colonel Fellows, as well as Major Sandra Perone, Canada's first female infantry officer. If you've not read her book, I commend it to you. It's outstanding in the field. And Captain Jackie Munn, leader of a U.S. cultural support team in Afghanistan. Their groundbreaking work underscores the need for allies who believe in and actively promote respect and inclusivity across the armed forces. True allies don't just talk about change, they drive change. Let's ensure that our policies reflect our commitment to equality and that our actions foster an environment where every service member thrives without bias or barriers. Let's ensure the military and our broader workplaces are places where diversity is celebrated as a source of our strength. The second principle of allyship is no. True allyship demands that we develop the insights to perceive how systemic biases and discrimination create unwelcoming environments. Understanding these systemic barriers empowers us to change the broader context in which women serve, fostering a sense of true belonging. These issues aren't always obvious. They're woven into the institutional practices and longstanding norms. When we look at promotion cycles, deployment schedules, or parental leave policies, do we truly see structures built for equity, or do they unintentionally reinforce disadvantages? Recognizing the impact of bias is crucial. It's not just overt sexism, but subtle assumptions about women's strengths, or their career interests, jokes that create a hostile climate, or unconsciously overlooking qualified women. These biases, intentional or not, create significant obstacles. True allyship demands a commitment to continuously learning and growth. Only then can we perceive these complex dynamics and more effectively, and more effective uh, allies in dismantling systemic obstacles to real belonging. The third principle of allyship is do. We must transform our beliefs and our perceptions into actions to truly enact allyship. Action demands proactive steps. And I propose these five actions for us to begin implementation. First, we must acknowledge systemic barriers. This begins with recognizing the effects of unequal access to career-enhancing assignments, deployment cycles that disproportionately impact working mothers, biases within evaluations and promotions, and limited mentorship opportunities. These barriers reveal significant shortcomings in our current system. Second, we need to challenge the merit myth we must dispel the notion of purely merit-based systems of ensuring women have equal access to career-enhancing opportunities. Implementing diversity training will enable leaders to identify and dismantle the systemic barriers that curtail women's potential. Third, we should build a fair pipeline by establishing clear paths for promotion and providing mentorship for all. We counteract the systemic biases that have historically restricted women's progress. Fourth, it is essential to scrutinize this process. We need to thoroughly examine our practices for hidden biases, particularly those embedded in performance, evaluation, and assignments. And lastly, I might suggest that we prioritize equity. We should question whether our decisions are truly based on objective criteria or if favoritism and bias subtly sway them. It's vital to assess leaders based on their effort toward diversity and inclusion and to ensure equitable representation in decision-making processes. These actions informed by our character and insight drive us toward a truly inclusive culture where diversity and inclusion are integral to success. 
This approach demonstrates how our beliefs and perceptions catalyze transformative action, fostering a welcoming environment for everyone. In conclusion, the principles of be, know, do lay the foundation of true allyship. Yet to truly transform our military culture, we must integrate these principles with the empowering framework of believe, perceive, achieve. Our journey is comprehensive, requiring us to value the, to believe in the value of every member, perceive systemic barriers to inclusion, and, dis, and take decisive action to achieve positive change. This dedication will elevate our military to unprecedented levels of inclusivity and strength. From essential to exemplary, this is the path to gender allyship in our military. By deeply embedding the believe, perceive, achieve principles into our ethos, we transform from a force that merely tolerates difference to one that thrives on it. Let's embrace this challenge, not only because it's necessary, but because it unlocks our true potential. May this steadfast commitment to allyship define who we are. Let's build a military where every member, irrespective of gender, feels valued, empowered, and integral. Together, we can establish a new standard for inclusion, where diversity is not merely a statistic, but the source of our greatest strength. Thank you.